and more about persuasive presentations, please forgive this giant title slide. Look at all those words. Categorizing persuasive presentations and Monroe's motivated sequence. Well, they do kind of go together. And there are two more or two of the last topics I need to cover related to, and are covered in your textbook, but I'll cover a little more detail, I believe, related to your persuasive presentation. Although we're going to have to go over some idea of like logical arguments and so on coming up soon that does relate to persuasive presentations. But you know, there's an awful lot at stake in persuasive presentations. Um, inf informed presentations are all well and good, but persuasive presentation is where the money is. Because, for instance, it's advertising, it's politics, it's really uh, uh, the area of this, of the, the, the presentation, the speech world, where there is a lot at stake. Um, so there's a lot of analysis of it. And think of all the billions of dollars spent on advertising. They want that stuff to work. And, and uh, Monroe's motivated sequence is behind a lot of it. So let's talk about categorizing pers persuasive speeches or presentations. In the same way that we categorized informa informative presentations, remember the, the COPE, C-O-P-E, concept, object, process, event? Yes, that worked for informative, but that doesn't work for persuasive. I mean, there are some elements of those things, but it's much better for us to categorize persuasive presentation topics. Really, we're categorizing the SPS again, right? As is it a is a persuasive presentation of fact, of value, of policy? And I, I've referred to these before in a number of past videos and even in class. Of fact, persuasive presentation of fact, that would be a like a courtroom drama, like a, like a lawyer would do. The, the what's that issue here are the facts. We have to understand these facts. The correct interpretation of these facts. Um, I'm going to tell you these are the facts you should be paying attention to in this case, not those facts. Um, these are the facts you can rely on. This is what these facts mean. So that's the, the typical uh, question of fact is, is a courtroom drama. And there's nothing wrong with learning that stuff. Um, and you can apply some, a lot of these same criteria, criteria will come along to that. But that's a pretty specialized um, area. It's a specialized area where I think persuasive and informative kind of overlap. Um, anyway, that's my own opinion, though. Um, then there's value. These are the tough ones. These are also the ones you're going to be pushed towards. Not, well, not pushed. I mean, you may feel like you want to try to tackle. Um, you might want to try to change people's uh, opinions. However, well, it's really changing their, their values, their underlying core beliefs. Um, well, that's uh, really uh, much harder than you would think. That's actually the hardest thing to persuade someone about, their beliefs, their morals, things that are critical to who you are. You could probably stay away from these topics. In this class, I want you to stay away from these topics, but in general, in life, these are the things that do not make a good cocktail party conversations because they always get people riled up. These are people's core beliefs. It, it angers people. People. It's hard to do. And you've got to really get people to trust you and and you really have to understand their point of view before you can kind of do that. Um, so, for instance, here's an example I'll use. If I want to persuade somebody that uh, a vegan lifestyle is the most moral choice for personal consumption, a vegan lifestyle. Um, because why? It creates the least suffering, the least pollution, the smallest carbon footprint. Those are the things I could say it was most moral. That would be an issue of value. And that would rub some people the wrong way. Because essentially what you're saying is they are immoral by whatever lifestyle that they have. Um, we would have to set up criteria for how to judge that that was a the most moral choice that would be part of the part of the speech so that's a tough one and i we're not going to do that we're going to focus on persuasive policy presentations questions of policy questions of changing behavior now that is true and i, I misspoke a bit earlier you could change it could be a, a policy presentation can change somebody's mind on something 
But that's not what we want to do. We want to go to the next step. We want to do a persuasive policy presentation that can change someone's mind and change their behavior, change something they do. It could be a small change, a big change, but that's what we're going to focus on. So um, how do you or how do you organize that kind of speech? Well, some of the basic structure is the same as informative. We have a general purpose. Now it's to persuade. We have a specific purpose statement. And the same rules about SPSs that apply to informative apply to persuasive about them not being trivial, not being have a multiple purpose, about them not being too vague. All that same stuff applies here too. Um, here's an example of one to persuade my audience that they should adopt a vegan lifestyle to reduce their dietary contribution to climate change. Um, or you could phrase that. You could probably phrase that better than I did. I wrote that minutes ago. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, something you should do. It's a change in behavior. That's my SPS. So then my, my central thesis has to get out to push how I'm going to do that, right? I have to, and, and you'll see how the central thesis is going to relate to a different way of thinking about the main ideas, the main points in just a moment when we get into that how the structure, how the organization is different. So we, we could label the speech, or you could say label the SPS as uh, fact, value, policy. Now we're looking at a policy. We're going down the policy road. Now we're looking at a policy persuasive structure here, right? And we're looking at that CT. What we don't see there are the traditional main ideas. The first thing is this, the second thing is this, the third thing is this. But there is a kind of a, of a signposting that still happens. It kind of depends on, on how the structure is organized. And we'll get to that when we get to the Monroe's motivated sequence too. But we're going to probably first say it's a, we have to create the need that's a serious problem. And then we offer the solution that, that's the vegan lifestyle. So at least those two things are going to be listed in the, the signposting, and maybe more than that. Perhaps we're going to also provide a visualization uh, in there too, and a bit more action. In fact, I would say this central thesis could probably be better in that way. We're going to, uh, th that climate change is a serious problem linked to our food. All right, good. And that a uh, way we can solve this problem is by adopting a vegan lifestyle, and that uh, if we visualize, we see that that lifestyle is not that different from our own, but the impact is very good, very great on the on the future, right? And the things we have to do specifically are um, stop eating meat and consuming other products that um, are based on animal production because of the amount of carbon that's created as a result of that. All of a sudden, you see you've got uh, your your main ideas have to do with how what about creating uh, describing the problem the need about um, then uh, satisfying that with a solution about visualizing that solution and how it's going to work and how it's things to be so much better as a result and then by about giving them actions to do so those become the signposted ideas uh, that's linking this idea of categorizing and organizing to what will come later which is Monroe's motivated sequence and about organizing persuasive policy speeches um, your textbook says that there's three ways to organize them, and these are fine to think about. I think I'm going to move on to think about Monroe's motivated sequence more myself. The problem solution, um, in the case of our vegan speech, it would say, here's the problem, climate change, and the, then the solution. So it's kind of like there's two main ideas in that speech only, right? Problem solution. But maybe a problem, what causes the problem, I'm going to spend more time analyzing that, and then offer the solution. So I kind of have three main ideas. Our comparative advantage is, is a very different kind of structure, and an interesting one. Um, imagine that we have two, a number of possible solutions that we're dealing with here. Maybe the persuasive policy speech isn't so much on the problem, maybe we're sort of assuming the problem, but now the policy presentation is change your behavior about which of the solutions you're going to pick. Um, so we can go through a comparative advantage design instead. I encourage you to read about these in your textbook. I'm not going to spend any more time on these. I'm going to switch instead switch over to Monroe and that whole argument. Um, but these are really useful and you will may use some version of the bolt all these ideas together when you organize your persuasive policy speech. And remember, look at organize. Okay. So this is this does have a parallel to the informative universe that we were in. You know, what would be the parallel? Is it a 
um, uh, how we how do we organize our uh, or really look at our central thesis and organize our uh, informative speeches, right? Sorry, just had someone come to the door. Um, what was I saying? And yes, okay, so organizing persuasive policy speeches. These are three ways that we organize them. And the parallel thing in the uh, in, in informative presentation world would be, or do we organize it as topical, as chronological, as causal, as process? So that's like the, the other side. Uh, this is problem solution, problem cause solution, or comparative advantage. Okay, Monroe's motivated sequence. The idea here, this, this theory, um, Alan Monroe, uh, is a very effective tool that's used, especially in, uh, in advertising, for instance. And if you start to look through this and start to look at ads, you'll start to see it, those ideas coming up in ads. But yet, you, it really has to do with persuasive uh, effects of all kinds in in, in, in words, in, in writing, and in speech, and in, in video, and so on. Um, so what, what he's really done is broken down this persuasive idea into these five steps. And um, we've already seen some of these steps. Um, first, we get people's attention. Then we create a need. In the informative presentations, it was a need to want to know the information this thirst for the information. In the persuasive, it's a need to solve the problem. We're, we're, pers we're persuading them that this is a, a problem that deserves attention. And then satisfaction step is when we give the, the solution to the problem. This is in, in detail with research. And then visualization, which we'll see is sometimes its own step and sometimes it's just a transition, is a, the, the other way, next way to look at it is a, the visualization, which is, um, I want to imagine, I want to see the image of this solution in action and, and how everything gets better. Or alternatively, I suppose you could people visualize if we don't do this, this is how things are going to look, how things are going to be worse. But we want to have people internalize the visualization, this, this change that will happen as a result of this fixing this problem. And then we want to tell them what do they need to do. And in the case of action, it might be one action, or more likely there's a few actions. And the actions can vary depending on their how motivated they are. Some things will be easy for some people and hard for others. Depends how much commitment they have to this problem. Whether So we like to give people a variety of solutions. For some people, it's just going to be go to the website and learn some more. For others, it's going to be donate money, uh, come to the march, um, vote for somebody, uh, and so on. Or maybe become a vegan. So those are the five steps. Let's look at them in, in the structural structures that we're familiar with. We can apply these five steps to the informative presentation. They aren't really made for informative presentation, but I think this is useful. Um, we only apply three of these steps here, and we've already done it, really, and this is what it means. Of course, our general purpose is to inform. We have an introduction in which we use attention-getting devices, so that's number one in Monroe. That's why I put the one there. Then we build to a specific topic, and then we, in doing that, we need to create the need to know, which we usually put research in here. We use sources that, to show that this is why you should want to know this information. This is why this information is important. And then we move to our preview statement, and that's in the end of our introduction. And in the case of an informative presentation, our satisfaction step isn't so much giving us the, the solution to the problem. It's giving us the information. It's satisfying that need to know that we created before, satisfying the need. Um, and those are the however many main points, main ideas that we have. It's a satisfaction step. That's why I call it number three here, although that's in the idea of, of the main ideas, Roman numerals. And then the conclusion is still our normal kind of conclusion. And although the idea of visualization, there's nothing wrong with using that in an informative presentation, there isn't necessarily action steps. And the visualization isn't a specified thing. So they don't, they don't apply as much to the informative presentation. But it all applies to the persuasive presentation, which is the world that it comes from. In, in the persuasive presentation, of course, we have our introduction. Well, of course, we are, our general purpose is to persuade. We have our introduction, which 
begins with what is actually number one, of course, again, the attention getting the attention step, which is attention getting devices. We build to our specific topic, right? And then we give a preview statement. The preview statement previews the main ideas still, but we haven't used so much a need step yet. All right. In the persuasive presentation, we get attention. We say what the problem is, right? And we might, but we're going to get to the idea of how it's so important later. So it's maybe alluded to and maybe even a source there, but we're mostly getting to, hey, there's this really big problem I'm going to talk to you about, and, um, and we're going to come up with some solutions. So first, I'm going to tell you why it's so important. Then, then second, I'm going to tell you what the solutions are. Then third, we're going to talk about how much better they can make things. And then fourth, we're going to talk about um, exactly what you can do to, to make a difference. So here's our main points, therefore, and there they are. Number, number two in Monroe is our first main point, and it's why we need to do something. So it's if there was no need to change, why give the speech? We have to prove it. We have to prove the problem. We need research and evidence here to, that, this, that this problem is a, a, a serious big deal. Um, so that's the, that's the need step. It's uh, why it's so important, why it affects you, why it's relevant, and why we need to do something about it. Um, we create that need, and we have, then we have to satisfy the need. We satisfy the need by providing the solution, not just in just telling it. We have to have research behind it. This is the solution. This is how we build the solution. This is other places where the solution was tried. This is the good things about the solution. This is how the solution is going to really work in detail. So there's a heavy amount of research here. And there's a heavy amount of research there. The visualization step, which is number four in Monroe and would be the third point here, may be its own step or may not be. Maybe, sorry, maybe its own main point or may not be. It is a step either way. Um, how much time do you, how much, how important is visualization to your presentation? And I think it's really a great idea. Um, it could just be a transition between the satisfaction, though, and the action step. It kind of works that way anyway. We, this is what the solution is. Now visualize the solution. And now this is how you can make that solution happen, right, with these actions. On the other hand, maybe you're going to spend some time on this. And maybe it really turns out to be its own main point. Either way, you're making them see how good things will be with the solution, um, about how it's going to, how what the, providing images for them to things for them to have in their mind that's going to help to push them along to an action. And about the action, you tell them what specific things they can do, yes. Um, but again, there may be more than one specific thing. Excuse my, my paper rustling. I want to make sure I tell you something I want to get here. Um, yeah, so, so we, we try to think about how Different people have different commitments to the problem. We're going to only be able to persuade some people so far, and other others will be able to sway, persuade even further. So the issue with the with the action is um, we probably have a variety of actions or varieties of intensities of actions, a variety of commitments of action, and we can get some people so far. And any movement we push people to is, is a success. Our goal is to get them to go all the way, but we don't want to make it all or nothing. We want to have, you can go this far and do something, or you can go a little further and do a little more. So we want to have a, ideally, yes, there's specific things to do, but maybe it's just not, not just one. And then the conclusion is just our normal conclusion. Echo the beginning, restate. Maybe we have a clincher at the end, too. Um, I'm afraid conclusions kind of get dropped off, but we're just, at least nothing else, trying to get them to take away some basic information in the conclusion. So um, that's uh, a bunch more stuff about persuasive, and I hope this helps you when you're thinking about your presentation and the whole persuasive world and maybe amplifies a little bit more on the reading that you've done.